Lord be with you. It is good to see you this evening. I want to welcome you as we gather in this space. It is Monday, Thursday, and we are at the tail end of Holy Week. Today, uh, as we celebrate, we do so uh, in the historical context of the Christian church that calls us during this week to be hypersensitive and super intentional uh, to paying attention to the narrative that leads us to the Easter story. Uh, today, as I said, is called Maundy Thursday. Maundy is a weird word. It is derived out of, out of the Latin, which means mandatum or mandate or command. Uh, normally on this day, we celebrate and remember uh, both the Last Supper and as well we remember foot washing as Jesus does to his disciples who are gathered around that table as they share a holy meal in the upper room. Today we won't be doing any foot washing. I can tell some of you are a bit bummed by that. But I can tell you this, we will be gathered at Christ's holy table and sharing a holy meal together in order that God might work in us in a new and profound way. I invite you now, uh, let us join together in singing our praises as we stand and sing hymn number 472, Near to the Heart of God. We're going to sing all three verses. <laughs> suffering. He quietly talked and extended himself in grace and compassion. He healed those who were suffering and invited sinners to turn and to follow him. Lord, in his own life and ministry, you used him to draw us closer to you and to set us free to live as your children. Grant us now that as we gather in this quiet space on the holiest of Thursdays to remember to reflect, and to be reminded who you've called each and every one of us to be. Help us, Lord, to rest in this story, to see ourselves around the table, to see your Son at work, offering himself in servitude, giving himself over in grace, allowing himself to be fully present with his followers. Lord, we may, may we now be fully present with you, clearing our hearts and our minds of all the troubles and the worries that exist outside these walls. Enable us, Lord, to rest in your presence. 
Give us that peace this hour and enable us to know you more. Be with us now, O God. Bless our worship and bless our time together. We ask all this in the name of the one who gives himself on our behalf, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. This evening we have the pleasure of reading from the Gospel of John. Tonight we'll be reading verse, uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, and then we're going to jump over and read verses 31 through 35. Traditionally on this day we read both stories of the Last Supper and stories of Jesus gathering with his disciples out of John's Gospel that focuses primarily on foot washing. But it leaves us with a mandate, with a new command, that we go forward and do as Christ has done for us. Would you pray with me? Gracious Father, we give thanks for the gift of these holy scriptures. And Father, as we stare over them and peer at them and seek to understand them, we are ever cognizant of the need of your Spirit. Help us this hour to interpret them and to know them as you would have us to know them. Speak to us now, O God, your words of wisdom and truth. And let the words of our own mouths and the meditations of our own hearts be pleasing in your sight. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you stand with me for the reading of the Gospel? The Gospel according to St. John, chapter 13 verses 1 through 17 and 31 through 35. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, well then not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, one who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he put on his robe and he returned to the table. And he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their masters, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things... You are blessed if you do them. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so I now say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just 
as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I think about my own growing up uh, today as I reflect upon these words. Jesus gives a very clear, strong command to his disciples that they should do what? Love one another. And also that they should perform acts of service for one another as Jesus washed their feet. One who was the host of this gathering, this party in the upper room. He had sent some of the disciples ahead to secure this space, knowing that it would be his last meal to share with his followers. They've spent the last three years following him all over the countryside. They've seen him perform countless miracles. They've seen him go into some hairy places and always make it through to the other side. They surely have no doubt that now that they are in Jerusalem, even though this is the worst possible place for Jesus to be, that he will make it to the other side. But they don't know what that looks like. And as they gather together, they're celebrating a well-known celebration in their own heritage a Passover meal, remembering God's holy people coming out of Egypt, out of slavery, led by Moses, and delivered to the other side. Remembering and spending time together is what they're doing. Remembering who God was in the past and the promises of who God will be in the future. And there in that place, Jesus, the host of this gathering, takes on the role of a servant. No doubt in that space there were others who had cooked and prepared the meal. It was the host's duty to get people assembled and to put them in charge of getting things in order and setting the table. The disciples would have been in a reclining position around the table and a servant would have come in with food and drink and kept the table full as they dined and ate together. The host's job is to yuck it up with the guests. To put people in order as we might do at our own dinner parties where like-minded people can sit next to each other and talk to one another and have a good time being together. And Jesus as the host would have sat with a few and talked and reminisced and made a memory being together with his company. In the midst of that, he stands up, he takes a towel, ties it around his waist, and goes to the disciples' feet. He pours water in a basin, and immediately they know what he's about to do. For one chief servant's job is to do what? To wash the feet of those who have been walking in sandals all over Timbuktu, near and far, and now that they have gathered in that place, not only should they wash their hands, but since we're going to be spending time together in close quarters, you should wash the feet. And a servant would have come around and done this for their group. Jesus takes on this role, washing their feet, wiping it with a towel, and showing them what it means to live as God's child. I think about my own upbringing. Those who modeled for me what it means to love one another. When I was in third grade, I got very sick and I got put in the hospital. I was there for about two weeks. And my class sent me cards and letters telling me they missed me. One of my friends who uh, unfortunately did not grow up to become a comedian, but he sent me one card and it said, we've got our fingers crossed, same as our eyes, hoping you get well soon. Some other students wrote beautiful things and pictures in there. Some of the little girls that I was sweet on drew big hearts and balloons to let me know that they were thinking about me. My teacher wrote this long letter talking about how I was one of her favorite students. Acts of love by people for no other reason who will gain nothing else out of the event 
other than the knowledge of knowing that they made someone feel appreciated, cherished, and a part of the group. Jesus shows us how to love one another when he takes on the servant's role and does for others what they cannot repay him to do, simply giving himself in such a way that others would feel beloved, cherished, and appreciated for being a part of the group. There in that space later, he would take the bread that was common to the table, nothing fancy, just common, ordinary table bread. And he would take common, ordinary table wine, and he would change the dynamic of their gathering together and institute what would be for them a remembrance and a participation in his own outpouring of grace and love for his disciples. Taking the bread, he would lift it up and say, this is my body broken for you. And this is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And tell them to do this as often as they could in remembrance of him. But the meaning of the gathering of that simple meal shared in an upper room would not be lost to history and lost to time, but it would perpetually regenerate over and over and over and over again that you and I, 2,000 years later, are here gathered at a table that we might remember the loving acts of our Lord. That we too might be empowered to go forward and share that love with others. Like the disciples we gather here, not knowing what will be after the meal. We're only called to just exist in this moment. Trusting that God will speak to us and do something with us that we don't even plan or comprehend. But that Christ is present with us in the elements and the gifts of broken bread and poured out wine. It is a shame in our United Methodist tradition that we do not receive the Lord's Supper any longer every Sunday morning. It pains me. It is a personal pain which I bear. John Wesley wrote a sermon of his many, he wrote hundreds of sermons, but he set aside a few sermons as doctrinal standards for people called Methodists. Sermon 101 is titled, The Duty of Constant Communion. And so often as we gather together, we would break the bread and share the wine and trust Christ to be in our midst. It is a command. Do this in remembrance of me. So much as the command that Jesus gives us what he says, I give you a new command that you love one another just as I have loved you so you also must love one another for everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another we share in this holy meal trusting that the spirit of Christ is here and that that love reigns and rests in our hearts and that you and I are called to go forth and share that same spirit infused in body and soul by these gifts and by these elements in order that you and I might be for the world broken bread and poured out wine. And wherever there is someone who is hurting, wherever there is someone who has lost hope, wherever there are people who need to hear the gospel, you and I would be an extension of this table. That we too would love as Christ has loved us, and as others interact with us, they would know without a shadow of a doubt that we are a follower of the one true God, the one who stands in our midst, who lives as one of us, who suffers our suffering, who takes them to the cross. 
puts them in the grave, and emerges that we might live forever. Today we're called to be here. And whatever you've got going on internally, whatever things have gone on this week that have been all kind of all over the place, and whoever you're mad at today, and, and whatever you're hoping to do tomorrow, let it go and be here. For what takes place here cannot be replicated anywhere else. Let us center our hearts and our minds. And prepare to come to the gospel feast. Amen. of the church is this, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. And I tell you, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Now as forgiven and reconciled children, I invite us now to offer each other signs of socially distanced peace as we prepare the table. Would you offer signs of peace to one another? This evening as we are preparing the elements and as they are set before you, we have both one bread and one cup. Uh, we also have um, separated cups as well. I do want to let you know tonight that instead of using Welch's grape juice, I have added a very, very sweet uh, wine in order that we might be as authentic to the original meal as possible. And as you come to the table today to receive these elements, again, I remind you that you would do so in the spirit of those disciples who sat around with their comrades, with their friends, with their Lord, in order that they might receive the blessing contained in that gathering. Would you stand with me as we proclaim the great thanksgiving? The Lord be with you. You. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made us covenant, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. 
And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, he fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, blessed it, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us be bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I invite you to come to the table as you feel laid. You can be as close to each other or as distant as you feel is comfortable for you. We have plenty of space and you are invited to remain at the altar even after receiving a blessing and spend time in prayer as is comfortable to you. Would you come as you feel that?
poured out for you, that you may go forward and live the gospel. pray with me. Holy and loving Father, we give thanks to you who have given yourself to us in this holy mystery. Grant that we who have gathered at your table today, like those men so long ago, might receive your blessing, might receive your peace that leads us through the challenging days ahead, but delivers us to hope eternal. Send us forward this day, inspired and infused by your Holy Spirit, born anew, regenerated and reinvigorated to follow you, to carry the cross, and to go the distance as your children. Send us forward, God, in your protection and in your grace. Amen. Closing him this morning, or excuse me, this evening. Our closing him this evening. It's going to be hymn number 408, The Gift of Love. Would you stand with me as we sing all the verses together? Hymn number 408.
in a way that could not separate them later on. We know the world awaits outside these doors with all of its challenges and all of its struggles and all of its trials, but we can trust that the Spirit of God goes with us and prepares a way for us to make it through and prepares a place for us at Christ's eternal banquet. May the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.